Welcome everybody on YouTube. So uh, please wait for a few moments until we start the talk in a few moments. So, noise everywhere. it should we start uh, sure yeah okay so um, welcome again everyone um, this is the last uh, talk of the fall um, and we're very happy to have um, Omri Weinstein and um, before I introduce the speaker uh, let me just introduce uh, um, Thomas, Thomas Hollenstein, who's helping here with the operation. And again, behind the scenes, we have uh, uh, Thomas Vidik uh, and uh, Clement Canon, um, uh, Gautam Kamat, and um, uh, Anindya De. So uh, maybe we should go quickly around the table to see who's uh, with us today. Let's see if it works. Last time we had some tr trouble, but today uh, we hope we fix it. So Thomas, please. Thank you, Odette. Yeah, I'll try. So. Uh, First of all, we have a group from Edinburgh here. So welcome, Edinburgh. Hello. Uh, we have a group from uh, Paris here, led by Lila Fontes. Hello, Paris. Then we have a group uh, which just joined from uh, UCID, UCSD. They are still setting up things, so I'll come to them later. We have a group from NYU. Um, led by Shravas Rao, welcome NYU. We have a group at um, the Simons Institute, welcome Simons Institute. We have a group led by Thomas Widdick at the Caltech, so I can only see the sofa, but I'm sure that they are here, welcome. Yeah, they're just joining. We start a bit early, it seems. So uh, everybody is still setting up. And then, as I said before, we have a group from UCSD. So uh, welcome, everybody, at UCSD. OK, thanks, Thomas. Um, so yeah, so today's speaker is um, um, Omri Weinstein, and um, he's um, currently is a PhD student in uh, in Princeton, a graduate student in Princeton, fifth, in his fifth year. Uh, he's being advised by uh, Mark Braverman. Uh, his uh, interests are mainly in uh, interactive communication, more generally communication complexity, uh, information theory, and today he'll talk about the topic more in the uh, intersection of economics and uh, computational complexity. Um, he um, he has the he won the Simons Award for graduate students uh, and also won the um, the Siebel uh, scholarship. Um, so um, so that's that's um, 
uh, that's for the uh, for the introduction, and uh, I'm, uh, we are uh, happy uh, to pass it to you. And uh, we will tell us today about approximating uh, Nash equilibria. So thank you, Omri. <laughs> So something is not working. It it seems you are muted, muted. Omri, yeah. and it seems I have trouble unmuting you because I don't know. Uh, now it's better. Perfect. Should I start from the beginning or? Yes. Okay. So uh, thanks uh, for the invitation and for all the technical support of the of the team. Uh, welcome everyone, and I will uh, be uh, talking about. Uh, in approximability results uh, for finding the best Nash uh, equilibrium. This is joint work with Mark Braverman and uh, Yang Kunko, who is uh, also uh, Mark's uh, student. So, uh, one of the primary motivations Wait. of yes. So before we begin, let's just put the microphone a bit further away from the mouth. Uh, we'll hear you better that way. Is that good? No, uh, it's maybe a bit too far, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> okay. How about good. Now? Good. Thanks. Great. Okay. So uh, one of the primary uh, motivations of game theory, when it was introduced in the 1940s, uh, was to develop a mathematical formalism for predicting a uh, stable outcome in a market with uh, self-interested players, where the players' uh, rewards are interdependent on. Uh, each other's actions. Uh, one of the uh, important aspects of algorithmic game theory uh, is to examine the uh, computational aspects underlying uh, various economic theories and in particular to understand how fast, if at all, does the market uh, even converge to such uh, stable outcomes. I think uh, Kamal Jain uh, said it better when he coined the term, uh, uh, you know, if your laptop can't compute it, uh, then neither can the market. And the main point being is that uh, we shouldn't base uh, uh, economic theory on the ability to solve uh, intractable problems. So uh, possibly the simplest model in which uh, these questions were examined is the setup of two-player uh, strategic games. In these uh, games, we have two players, row and column player, or uh, I will sometime abuse the notation and call them Alice and Bob from my uh, communication complexity history. Uh, so each player has a set of possible actions or uh, pure strategies, so to speak. Uh, and we will assume uh, a symmetric games, so uh, the action sets X and Y are symmetric. Uh, each player has uh, a pre-specified uh, payoff matrix, uh, R and C respectively, which specifies the reward for each uh, joint uh, choice of actions X and Y. And uh, as the game proceeds, uh, each player, Alice and Bob, can choose uh, a mixed strategy or a distribution over pure strategies, uh, mu and nu, or uh, X and Y. Um, such that uh, the expected payoff of, of the row players is given by the quadratic form X transpose uh, RY, which is nothing more than just uh, uh, the, prob the expected uh, probability that uh, the action XY is chosen times uh, the reward for Alice, or the row player, in, uh, from the choice of this outcome. So. Uh, any questions up to here? This is the ba this will be the basic uh, setup of of this uh, talk. Okay. So uh, the question that that uh, uh, is being asked is what uh, you know what notion captures uh, a stable outcome in such games? And uh, arguably the most uh, uh, popular solution concept is that uh, is due to Nash. Uh, so a Nash equilibrium intuitively means that uh, no player has an incentive to defect uh, from the proposed uh, set of strategies, X and Y, 
presuming that uh, the opponent uh, adheres to his own uh, prescribed uh, strategy. More formally, if uh, assuming that uh, Bob sticks to the strategy Y, Alice has no better choice than X uh, in the sense that no, no other action replacing F X with uh, another action X tilde will not gain him uh, a better payoff and vice versa uh, for Bob. So if Alice sticks to the strategy X, Bob might as well stick to his own proposed strategy Y. He cannot gain a better payoff by defecting uh, to a different strategy. So one remark that will be important actually later in the talk, uh, um, it's a subtle point which uh, will come up later, but uh, the, the simple observation that Nash equilibrium is, a, a, is, a, is inherently an uncorrelated uh, solution concept in the sense that um, the joint distribution on strategies that is produced by the players is inherently a product distribution. So. Um, uh, Alice and Bob uh, choose their own strategies uh, uh, independently. And the uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, theorem of Nash is that every finite uh, two game, uh, two player game always has at least uh, one mixed uh, Nash equilibrium. Uh, the word mixed is important because some game games, in fact many games, uh, do not exhibit, exhibit any uh, pure equilibrium. Uh, but in fact, the reality of, of, of things is that uh, many games typically exhibit uh, a variety, many, many equilibria, some of which are better, uh, are more desirable than others. And a classic uh, example is the uh, Battle of the Sexes game. Uh, so Alice and Bob wish to go on a date. Uh, Alice prefers going to the opera, but uh, Bob prefers to uh, stay home and watch the football match. Uh, and the payoffs are specified by this uh, table here. But both players prefer going together on the date than uh, doing their favorite uh, uh, attractions uh, by themselves. So this game exhibits uh, two pure Nash equilibria going to the opera together uh, or uh, staying home and watching the football uh, match, but uh, you know, going to the football match smells like a better uh, equilibrium in the sense that uh, it has a better uh, welfare. It, it it maximizes the happiness uh, of both players. Um, so indeed, uh, the the most common measure of the efficiency of an equilibrium is uh, its social welfare, which is just the sum of the players' payoffs. Um, is that uh, clear? Okay, so this is this will be uh, the common uh, uh, measure of efficiency uh, uh, that will underlie uh, this talk. And uh, this setup gives rise to the computational question, the following computational question. We're given uh, uh, two n by n payoff uh, matrices, R and C, with constant size entries, so you can think of the entries as being bounded in the interval 0 and 1. How hard is it uh, to output, to compute a, a Nash equilibrium in this game? And the answer is that, well, it seems very hard, even if we ignore the quality uh, of the equilibrium. Uh, so finding an exact Nash equilibrium is, uh, is, is a problem which is complete for uh, a class called PPAD, which I will not get into, but uh, we have, uh, we have uh, reasons to believe that uh, this class uh, certainly requires super polynomial time and um, uh, potentially even uh, exponential time. Uh, we don't have rigorous evidence for this, in, uh, unfortunately, and I will try to come back to this point uh, at the end of the talk. Um, as to the objective maximizing problem, so finding uh, the best the best Nash equilibrium, the, namely the one that maximizes the welfare, is in fact uh, an NP-complete problem. And all of these uh, negative results kind of gave rise to uh, uh, the following, the natural relaxation of the problem. So in epsilon, we say that a, a pair of mixed strategies, X and Y, form an epsilon approximate uh, Nash equilibrium or simply epsilon Nash, 
if uh, intuitively no player has more than an epsilon additive incentive to defect um, from the current proposed strategy. So uh, again, if Bob plays the proposed strategy Y, Alice cannot gain more than an additive factor of epsilon by defecting to a strategy uh, X tilde and vice versa uh, for, for Bob. Any questions uh, up to here? OK. Uh, so this relaxation, apart from making uh, uh, the problem potentially uh, easier in the computational sense and making it potentially more tractable, it is also appealing in the sense that uh, it can capture a richer set of desirable behaviors. So for example, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the iterated uh, prisoner's dilemma, uh, we know that the unique uh, Nash equilibrium of this iterated game is simply to always defect. However, in practice, it was observed that players tend to play a, a slightly less restrictive uh, uh, strategy like tit for tat or grim trigger, where uh, one player will cooperate until uh, the opponent defects. And once this happens, um, the player will start defecting uh, forever. So the, the main theme of this relaxation is that it allows to capture um, a richer set uh, of strategic behaviors which are not captured by exact uh, equilibrium. And indeed the problem we will, the computational problem we will consider in this talk is, uh, is called Nash Epsilon. Uh, so given, uh, again, two payoff matrices, uh, the column player and the row player's uh, payoff matrices, and a fixed parameter, approximation parameter, epsilon, how hard is it to find an epsilon uh, approximate uh, uh, Nash equilibrium whose social welfare is at most epsilon less than the optimal welfare, where the... Where the uh, where the, where the benchmark, uh, we compare ourselves to uh, the best exact uh, equilibrium. So notice that this is a bi-criteria problem. Uh, in principle, we could use epsilon and delta, but uh, the standard uh, um, formulation of the problem is that uh, we use epsilon in both places. So we're seeking an approximation in, in two criteria. The first epsilon, the first criteria is, is the strategic one, so we need an epsilon approximate equilibrium. The second criteria is the efficiency. We don't want to compromise by more than an epsilon uh, compared to the uh, best. Thomas, I see you're, you have a question or? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I do have a question. So, so the question is kind of, you say that, okay, there are two possible parameters. You call them epsilon and delta in, in the general case. So can you quickly comment what happens if you set one of those to zero? So if you have epsilon and zero or, or zero and delta, or will you do that? Right. So I, th I think I said it, I think, before. So if you set epsilon in the efficiency to zero, so if you're seeking the best, oh, I see, but so you're seeking the best equilibrium, but um, then I'm actually not sure how hard is it to find. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure what happens if you if you are seeking. Uh, but actually, I think if you set the second parameter to zero, you must find an. Uh, well, it's not it's not clear. I'm not sure, actually, what happens. Okay. Um, but certainly if, certainly, if you set the first parameter to, epsilon, to zero, then the problem is at least PPAD complete. It, I think it might be, uh, I think this is all is, that is known. Um, yep. Are we? Yeah. Uh, maybe you're about to say that, but in the other extreme, where you actually set the second parameter to you just want to find any epsilon approximate, then it's easy, right? It's very easy to find any epsilon approximate Nash. Uh, oh, right. That that's true. So that can be done in uh, polynomial time. So infinity, you mean one, right? So. Uh, yeah, one. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that is true. So again, the unconstrained uh, problem, as far as we know, as far as I know, is, is just the PPAD completeness. Uh, 
results. If you set the second, uh, if you set uh, both parameters to zero, then you get NP completeness. Uh, and as Oded said, if you're willing to relax the first one arbitrarily, then it's easy. Then it's polynomial time. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so uh, the question is whether this computational problem uh, significantly reduces the complexity uh, of the problem. And uh, perhaps a surprising answer is, is yes, significantly. So um, uh, several years ago, uh, Lipton, Markakis, and Meta uh, showed us, uh, in hindsight, uh, maybe not so surprising, but uh, at this time it was a surprising result that one can solve uh, this relaxed problem in actually in, in quasi-polynomial time. And they used a remarkably uh, simple but uh, surprisingly powerful result um, uh, uh, technique, sorry, of, of random sampling. And the core, uh, the core element underlying their idea is to uh, indeed use random sampling to argue that uh, in every uh, finite two-player game, there exists the al there always exists an epsilon approximate Nash. Uh, with small support sizes, so uh, where uh, the support sizes of the mixed, uh, the mixed equilibrium of both players is only uh, logarithmic. Um, so, in fact, the proof is so simple that we'll be able to uh, give a complete sketch of it uh, right here. So, let mu uh, comma nu or x comma y be uh, uh, any Nash equilibrium. We can uh, choose it to be the optimal Nash equilibrium. The proof will work. Uh, just as well, um, and let us just sample uh, log n over epsilon squared uh, iid samples from um, mu and nu uh, uh, independently. So this yields uh, two um, two sets uh, of set of size log n over epsilon squared, and let's take x prime and y prime to just be the uniform distribution over this these uh, logarithmic size sets. Right, so I claim that uh, just a standard Chernoff bound um, argument implies that uh, these sets are uh, these sets uh, th this these mixed these new mixed uh, strategies form an epsilon equilibrium, just because uh, if you know if defecting if it's possible to defect um, if Alice can defect from x prime to x tilde prime when Bob sticks to y prime then and, and gain from it, then she'll be able to gain even in the original uh, uh, setup where uh, Bob sticks to y. And this is just standard concentration bounds. All right, and moreover, the same exact concentration argument uh, can be applied to the welfare of the equilibrium. Uh, so up to an epsilon additive factor, the epsil the the welfare of the uh, of the uh, of the strategy set x prime and y prime uh, is guaranteed to be within an epsilon factor away uh, from optimal. All right, so this is uh, so this is just a proof of existence, and now to uh, actually find such an equi equilibrium with small support, the players need to just they can just exhaustively uh, enumerate over all uh, logarithmic support uh, strategies. And this takes, uh, just with no extra cleverness, it takes uh, just uh, n to the log n time, roughly. Okay, and this, this is pretty much uh, it. And so this uh, quasi-polynomial uh, algorithm uh, kind of sparked up the hope that, uh, you know, who knows, maybe a, a PTAS uh, uh, exists for uh, this relaxed problem. And indeed, in the following years, uh, many follow-up works concentrated on trying to reduce uh, 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 the epsilon is to get the, the, the result uh, for reduced uh, epsilon parameters. Uh, and the main, so all these works here uh, basically try to perform the exhaustive search um, of Lipton's uh, algorithm in a more efficient way and to avoid the quasi-polynomial time and restrict it to uh, uh, polynomial time uh, using some linear programming and so forth. And uh, kind of the state of the art of this work 
is uh, a 0 0.34 equilibrium uh, with the caveat that this particular work actually does not guarantee anything on the, the welfare. So kind of this, uh, the, the bottom line of, the, of this line of work is uh, 0 0.34 equilibrium in polynomial time. Um, and one could think that uh, we could keep uh, going on and uh, find uh, uh, efficiently better and better equilibria, but unfortunately in, in 2009, uh, Hazan and Krautgommer uh, in subsequent uh, work by uh, Austrian et al. showed that um, uh, PTAS for Nash Epsilon is, is uh, very unlikely. So what they showed is that solving Nash Epsilon, finding an Epsilon approximate Nash with good welfare is at least as hard as uh, the hidden clique problem. In this problem, uh, one needs to distinguish between um, two possible graphs. The first graph is just the random graph g and half. The second one is, uh, again, g and half plus um, a planted clique on uh, a subset of 10, let's say, 10 log n uh, vertices. Okay, so notice that these two instances are, are statistically distinguishable because uh, the random graph g n half is very unlikely to contain a clique of size more than, let's say, 3 log n. Um, and what uh, Hazan and Krathgomer showed is that uh, finding any uh, efficient Nash equilibrium here can be used to recover uh, the clique of size, of size uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, log n. And uh, this shows that, um, uh, that this problem, the problem Nash epsilon, is at least as hard as, uh, as the hidden clique problem. So, you know, what is the best hardness result we can expect from, uh, from this result? So notice that planted clique is actually uh, not too hard to solve, so it always admits a trivial solution in uh, quasi-polynomial time because one can simply enumerate over all possible cliques of size, or all possible uh, uh, subsets of size 10 log n, and of course only one of the graph, only in the yes case, the, gra the graph will exhibit such a clique, and brute force enumeration takes uh, only uh, quasi-polynomial quasi time. So we cannot uh, expect um, uh, a better hardness result here. Um, how believed is this result? Well, uh, it is widely believed that uh, planted clique indeed requires a super polynomial time, uh, but maybe the, uh, the, the, the one drawback of this result is that it, it really relies on, on an average case uh, uh, problem. And uh, the sad reality of, of complexity theory is that we barely have uh, any techniques for proving average case hardness. So no, no, one, no one really knows uh, how hard uh, this problem really is. And uh, indeed, what we show in this work uh, is arguably a more uh, a robust evidence, uh, slightly stronger evidence uh, for the hardness of, of, uh, of this problem. So we show that any asymptotic improvement on, on Lipton's uh, uh, quasi-polynomial algorithm uh, for Nash Epsilon will, uh, will break, will re refute the, the, the ETH conjecture. Uh, so this uh, conjecture uh, says that uh, simply that any deterministic algorithm uh, for solving a 3-set requires a strictly exponential time. Okay, any questions uh, up to here? I went on for, for a while. Okay, um, so the ETH conjectures that uh, uh, exp exponential time is required to solve uh, a three set. If we combine this with uh, the PCP theorems of uh, Dinor and uh, Moshkovitz and Raz, uh, then essentially the same statement applies even to the more modest task of distinguishing between the case that the formula is completely satisfiable or at most, let's say, 0 0.9 clauses are a uh, fraction of the clauses uh, are satisfiable. So I'm cheating here a little bit because in order to have this gap version, we do need uh, a uh, to pay a little bit in the, we need to blow up the instance size from n to 
something like n times log n, but uh, I will ignore this point uh, for the talk. So you can just add a tilde uh, to our, uh, a tiny tilde to the uh, hardness result, uh, but for the purpose of this talk, I will uh, ignore this, uh, this detail. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the basic hardness uh, uh, result of this, uh, from which we uh, uh, begin our, uh, our reduction. So what we're really seeking now is, uh, you know, a gap-preserving reduction from uh, 3SAT to Nash Epsilon with a non-trivial, so with a sub-exponential uh, blow-up in the in instance size, of course. And so uh, at first glance, these problems seem uh, uh, quite different from each other, right? Uh, so how would you reduce SAT to... Uh, to a strategic game, you know, SAT is not even uh, uh, a strategic setup. There are no players and no strategies. Um, so at first, this may seem uh, like a uh, uh, pretty uh, odd uh, reduction. But perhaps to unravel uh, the, the mystery, at least uh, the first level, uh, it is useful to, to look at the, the PCP as a, a statement about um, about a, a, as a statement about collabor uh, constraint satisfaction games uh, or uh, as collaborative games. Uh, and indeed, uh, one view of the PCP uh, uh, is as uh, the following game, uh, the clause variable game of, of the formula. So given a three-sat formula phi with n variables, we can associate uh, with it the following game. This game, uh, G sub phi, is a game with two provers, Alice and Bob, and uh, one verifier, Arthur. And the game proceeds uh, as follows. So the referee, Arthur, just uh, picks uh, a random, a completely random clause, CJ, from the uh, set of clauses of phi. And he chooses uh, a random variable, X, from the three possible variables inside this clause, CJ. Now he sends uh, the clause CJ to Alice and the variable to XI to Bob. And he, what he expects is a, a satisfying assignment uh, to the variable uh, CJ from Alice and a satisfying assignment for the, uh, um, for the variable or for the literal uh, XJ. And he expects these assignments to be consistent uh, with each other. So the players are said to win the game if they send back uh, consistent and satisfying assignments. Okay, so in general, uh, this game, uh, these games are called uh, two prover games, uh, and two prover games in general can be viewed as uh, can be thought of as uh, bipartite graphs, uh, where each player, Alice and Bob, has his own uh, challenge or question set, uh, x and y. And the way the game proceeds is that uh, the verifier, Arthur, just uh, picks a random edge, x, y, from the graph according to some uh, distribution mu on challenges. And this distribution will be uh, very important. So it's crucial uh, what is the, actually the distribution that uh, uh, Arthur picks according to. And then he sends the two endpoints of this edge uh, to the players, uh, Alice and Bob. And uh, he expects uh, them to send back, uh, simultaneously without communication, a satisfying uh, assignment to this edge. Right? And we say that uh, the value of the game is just uh, the maximum over all possible response strategies of the expected value, the expected, uh, the, just the probability that uh, uh, a random edge according to mu is being satisfied according to those. Um, to those pre-specified uh, pre response uh, uh, strategies. Any questions uh, to here? OK, so uh, the claim is that uh, for the particular two-prover game G sub phi, the clause uh, variable game uh, of the formula phi, uh, I, we claim that uh, the value of the game essentially characterizes the uh, maximal uh, fraction of clauses that uh, are satisfied. So the first direction is almost immediate. Suppose the uh, the formula phi is completely satisfiable. 
then the players, I claim that the players have uh, uh, a response strategies uh, with value, with uh, just uh, success probability one. They just answer according to uh, uh, one particular satisfying assignment. Right, they will always win no matter what clauses and variables are chosen. As to the soundness, uh, it's slightly more uh, complicated, but still very intuitive. So suppose the the value of the formula is only, let's say, uh, zero point uh, eight clauses are, are are satisfied. Then there is at least then at least assuming by the averaging principle that Alice responds according to a some deterministic. Uh, 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 assignment which uh, can be done, then no matter what uh, assignment ans Alice responds according to, there is always at least a 0 0.2 chance that Arthur picks an unsatisfied clause under this assumption, in which case there is at least one over th uh, just a third uh, chance that um, uh, Bob gets challenged the literal which is exactly not satisfied in this uh, in this uh, clause. Okay, so again, no matter what Alice uh, uh, responds according to, there is at least a 0 0.2 chance of selecting an unsatisfying clause. And in this unsatisfied clause, there is at least uh, a chance of a third that um, Bob will fail to, to provide a, a, a consistent answer. Okay, so this shows, this theorem essentially shows that um, the PCP can re can be restated uh, in terms of two prover games. So uh, our convention will be uh, uh, the following uh, restatement. Uh, so approximating the value of uh, a general two prover game G to within an epsilon arbitrarily small uh, uh, additive factor is an NP hard task. And furthermore, the ETH conjecture uh, would uh, assert that this task requires a strictly exponential time. All right, every, uh, everyone happy with this uh, uh, statement? Okay, so uh, unfortunately, general games are uh, are very hard to uh, to approximate. But uh, in a, in a really nice uh, recent work uh, of Aronson in Palazzo and uh, Dana Moshkovic, uh, the authors considered uh, a very restricted, a special type of, of two prover games called free games. So a two prover game is called uh, a free game if the distribution mu of the questions of the challenges just so happens to be a product distribution. So the challenges of Alice and Bob are chosen uh, independently. Okay, and this talk, for the purpose of this talk, you can think of mu as just the uniform distribution. Uh, on challenges. All right, so as a remark, notice that the the clause variable game G sub phi is very far from being a free game, right? Because conditioned on uh, Alice's challenge, the clause, Bob's challenge uh, set shrinks from all possible n variables to just three possibilities. These are just the variables appearing in this clause. So Alice and Bob's challenges in, in, in the clause variable game are, are highly dependent, so this is not a free game. Um, uh, yeah, so this, is, uh, this will be uh, important uh, in a second. So the figurative way to think of a two-prover uh, free game is just as the complete bipartite graph where, uh, Alice, uh, where Arthur simply uh, chooses a com just a uniform edge in this uh, complete graph and just sends the two uh, endpoints to the players. Okay, so one could ask, uh, you know, whether freeness actually reduces the, uh, the computational complexity of, of uh, approximating the game's value. So given a free game G of size uh, N, the size is just the cardinality of the challenge uh, and, uh, and uh, answer sets. How hard is it to estimate the value of the game to within an additive uh, factor epsilon? And um, it turns out that indeed the independence of challenges does significantly reduce the, uh, the complexity of this game. So it turns out that free games can be solved, uh, can be approximated in quasi-polynomial time. 
And if this quasi-polynomial term uh, reminds you an earlier term uh, from this talk, this is uh, uh, definitely not a not a coincidence. So um, Aronson and Pagliazzo and Moskowitz's uh, algorithm is very uh, very similar to uh, Lipton et al.'s uh, algorithm for uh, for Nash epsilon. So again, the idea is to randomly sample logarithmically many challenges for each player, and then uh, enumerate just in a brute brute force fashion over the best uh, response strategy over this small uh, restricted uh, set of challenges. So a brute force enumeration over a small a challenge set of logarithmic size can be done in uh, again in in Quasi polynomial time. So, oh, oui. Yes. Oui. Uh huh. So, uh, you mean you sample, say, on Alice's side and then try for each setting of Alice's uh, answers uh, the best response of Bob? Or uh, this is an asymmetry between Alice and Bob here I'm trying to figure out? No, at least as far as I remember, uh, you sample. Uh, log n over epsilon squared challenges from each uh, subset, and then you just uh, just enumerate over all possible. You just uh, uh, compute the value of the uh, of the game under all possible response strategies from log n challenges to uh, you know to. It, does that make sense or? Uh, so you're saying you 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 restrict the distribution just to those um, you know log n exactly. cross log n exactly. So the term right here, the term uh, th this term uh, in the bottom of the slide will be computed. The expectation will be taken over a subset of the edges. Mm -hmm. all, okay, it's just all the edges. The complete bipartite graph on logarithmic sized uh, yeah sets. Mm -hmm. Because at some point you need a unit bound. I mean, for the log n to show up, you would need a unit bound over n things. If there's no unit bound over n uh, over n things, you can just take constant sample. So that's why I'm. I mean, n should show up somewhere. Right. That's a good point. So I. I actually. Yeah. That that okay, that is. We can so take it offline. Uh, that that that's yeah. right. That is that is true, and also. Um, what did I want to say? Uh, I had uh, another uh, remark. Um, oh, so yeah, so of course the independence has to come in in this uh, analysis, right? So somehow for this strategy works for independent challenges and not for correlated challenges. That that must be the case, right? We know uh, for general games this is impossible. Okay, so um, perhaps even I think it, the the even uh, 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 nicer result of uh, uh, of Aronson uh, et al's uh, paper is that uh, this algorithm is in fact uh, optimal up to polylogarithmic uh, factors, assuming uh, the exponential time uh, hypothesis. Uh, so how do they prove this optimality? Uh, is by uh, essentially a black box uh, value preserving technique which allows one to convert any just an arbitrary a general uh, two prover game into a free game with a non trivial blow up in the instance size right so you can always do this uh, to map to singletons in in exponential time but they show a way that uh, maps a general game into a free game in a non trivial way so in sub exponential time something like 2 to the square root n size and they call this uh, technique uh, birthday repetition for reasons that will become clear hopefully uh, in a minute but if you just if you believe this reduction then notice that uh, the last two results imply an algorithm for set right so let's take our uh, n variable formula phi we can think of it uh, just in terms of uh, the associated uh, uh, clause variable game of phi. Now we can use uh, the birthday repetition technique to transform g sub phi into a free game with a blow up of uh, uh, 2 to the square root n roughly, right? 
And now we have an algorithm for uh, for free games, right? That runs in quasi polynomial time in in large n. So we can solve this instance in big n to the uh, log big n uh, time, which is exactly uh, exponential time, right? So the corollary is that any improvement on the quasi polynomial time of solving free games, any asymptotic improvement up to this tilde would yield a sub-exponential time for set, right? So I think the, the um, right, so in this would obviously uh, refute uh, ETH. So at least on a very superficial level, the, the technical message of this talk, or at least of uh, uh, the AIM uh, paper, uh, is that uh, uh, morally quasi-polynomial time in the right scale, the right scale being 2 to the square root n, uh, is actually exponential time in the original scale. So if big N is 2 to the square root N, right, a, a big N to the log big N is exactly 2 to the N. Okay, so this is at least uh, a, a very technical uh, view of this result, but this is the, um, the, the moral, uh, the technical moral of the story. And uh, let me just say a few words about how this birthday repetition works, how do we transform a, f uh, a general game uh, into a free game? And I'm not doing this just to amuse you, uh, I'm doing this because the structure of this, uh, uh, of this outputted game will, will, will play a role in our, our own uh, reduction. So, uh, so how do we convert a general game to a free game? So let's just do it for the clause variable game, g sub phi. So now instead of Arthur, uh, instead of choosing uh, just a single clause from, from the formula, Arthur can now choose uh, many clauses, many independent clauses, uh, let's say roughly uh, square root n clauses. And then he completely independently chooses uh, square root n roughly uh, variables from the formula. So here there is no dependence between the variables and between Alice's challenges in Bob's uh, challenges. And then he sends, of course, all uh, square root n uh, challenges to Alice and all square root n uh, variables to Bob. And he expects an assignment uh, from both players which will satisfy simultaneously all the square root n clauses, all the square root n variables, and will be consistent with each other on any clause in which uh, a variable xij just so happens to appear uh, in Alice's challenges. Maybe I said this a little bit uh, confused. Is that is that clear? Any questions on that? So, right, so Arthur might as well uh, ask for um, simultaneous satisfaction of all these uh, constraints because a truly satisfying, a completely satisfying assignment will indeed satisfy all those just responding according to a completely satisfying assignment will simultaneously satisfy all of these challenges simultaneously, right? Okay, so he might he might as well just uh, ask for uh, uh, for all these uh, constraints to be satisfied, um, right? So now, uh, figuratively speaking, Arthur will just choose two independent sets of size, roughly square root n of each side, and he will ask for all the edges crossing uh, between these two sets to be satisfied, right? So by definition, we said uh, uh, the game, uh, this birthday game is, is a free game because the challenges uh, of Alice and Bob are, are indeed independent. What is the intuition for the value of this game being preserved? Why is the value of this uh, free game uh, roughly equal to the value of the original clause variable game? So of course I will not uh, uh, give the full proof, but the intuition is just the birthday paradox, right? So um, if square root n challenges are, are being chosen, square root n clauses, and square root n variables are being chosen, then this choice gives Arthur a constant chance of catching the players if they're trying to cheat, right? There is a constant chance of some variable xi to occur in some li in some clause, this is in some clause C J of of Alice, right? And if this event occurs, then well, um, 
again, with 0 0.2 chance, by the previous reasoning, there is a chance that uh, Arthur will catch Alice and Bob if they're trying to cheat and answer according to uh, an inconsistent uh, assignment. Okay, so uh, just trying to argue that this reduction is intuit intuitively plausible, not trying to give a, a formal proof. And of course, the uh, doing making this formal is is of course, uh, as we know, a much a much uh, harder uh, task. Okay, everyone uh, happy until now. Uh, all right. So again, I'm not. I didn't do this just to amuse you. The structure of this game will be uh, will play an important role. Uh, so you can now just forget. Uh, if you didn't follow the, the last uh, 20 minutes, the, the bottom line of all of this uh, buildup is that there is some reduction running in time roughly 2 to the square root n, which maps any sat formula phi of size n into a symmetric free game, uh, let's call it h sub, uh, sub phi, that has the following structure. So s and t are now not just atomic challenges. They're not just... Uh, um, uh, uh, primitives, right? S and T are now just uh, square root n tuples of challenges, of original challenges from a ground set n. Right? Remember, Arthur picked uh, square root n clauses and square root n variables. With an extra trick, we can make this game uh, uh, symmetric. So just think of it as, uh, as a, uh, a new game with where each question, each challenge is a k tuple, a square root n tuple of original elements from a ground set n. And therefore, the size of this game is roughly 2 to the square root n, right? The size of the game is just the product of the cardinality of the sets. And we know that if uh, uh, each challenge is a vector of size square root n, then the answer set is has to be of size uh, uh, n to the square root n, right? This is these are all the possible answer vectors for square root n sized uh, uh, vector. Okay, so the bottom line is that uh, the size of this game, the size of this uh, um, uh, birthday repetition free game, is two to the square root n roughly. Okay, and this is really the the uh, uh, the starting, the real starting point of our uh, of our reduction. So our main result is kind of completes the last mile here. So it shows that um, this particular free game can be further reduced in time, uh, in comparable time. So in time two to the roughly square root n into a two to the square root n sized uh, two-player strategic game G, such that uh, uh, the gap is preserved. So if the value of the free game h sub phi is 1, then uh, the strategic game g indeed has uh, an exact Nash equilibrium, not even approximate. So it has an exact Nash equilibrium of welfare 1. And uh, if the value of this repeat of the free game is less than epsilon, then any epsilon star equilibrium, where epsilon star is roughly epsilon over 100 or something, uh, then every epsilon star equilibrium of G has welfare at most uh, order epsilon. Okay, and the important thing being is that uh, epsilon and epsilon star are both constants. Okay, so clearly any algorithm for solving Nash epsilon must distinguish between these two cases, right? And this immediately uh, directly implies that uh, Nash epsilon indeed requires uh, uh, quasi-polynomial time up to this tilde factor, uh, assuming that sat requires uh, uh, exponential time. In fact, a polynomial algorithm for Nash ep uh, epsilon, uh, we will show that this uh, yields uh, roughly 2 to the square root n algorithm for sat, which would be uh, very, very surprising. Okay, so before I, uh, so Oded, how much uh, time do I have? Uh, I think you can, um, you can definitely take at least 10 more minutes. Uh, it's okay to go a bit over time, but if you find a natural place to stop, you can stop, and then those who want to stay can stay longer. Uh, we're happy to stay longer if, you, if there's more to talk about. Up to you. Okay, sure. 
Uh, okay, so let me uh, try to dive in uh, to the reduction. As I mentioned, uh, uh, this is not a black box uh, reduction, and we will use the, the structure of, uh, of H sub phi. So uh, a reduction does not work for any free game. Uh, this will be important. So just to recap, uh, we saw how to reduce to um, uh, a, a three-set formula to amplify the gap using uh, the PCP then map it to uh, think about it as the clause variable game, use birthday repetition to turn it into a free game, and the last mile is actually mapping this um, free game id sub phi into a, a strategic uh, two-player game. Okay, so how would we map, uh, how would one map uh, the game, the free game id sub phi into a cooperative or a collaborative actually, cooperative is a misleading word. How would we map it into a collaborative game, a strategic game, um, uh, in a gap-preserving uh, fashion? So the natural idea would be to just, you know, uh, map, uh, just try to give pl both players a payoff which is equal to uh, their winning probability according to uh, to uh, response strategies in in H sub phi. More formally, suppose um, we take uh, uh, this uh, natural path. So the pure strategies of Alice and Bob would be all possible response functions, f and g, that map all challenges, all uh, tuples in the uh, game uh, h sub phi into the answer set. Right. So this is a this is a big reduction. Right. So each element. And the support here is an entire truth table. It's an entire strategy, right, um, uh, of the players. And uh, naturally, for a particular choice of F and G by Alice and Bob, the payoff we assign to both players is just the expected, uh, the just the expected uh, probability of winning uh, the free game using these strategies, F and G. Okay, so. I, uh, in terms of of, uh, of correctness, uh, there's almost nothing to argue here. It's pretty clear that this reduction works, right? Because uh, both the, the incentives of both players are aligned here. Both of them get rewarded uh, re rewarded according to um, uh, uh, the winning probability. So neither of the players will have an incentive to defect from the optimal response strategy. So it's pretty clear that uh, the value of the game here, uh, of the free game, is uh, equal, in fact, to the uh, to the welfare produced by the best equilibrium. And this reduction Maybe carries up to over. factor two or something. Right. Sorry, up to a factor two. Good point. Thanks. Okay. The but as uh, we insinuated, there is only one problem, of course, with this uh, reduction. And it's just huge. It's just too big, right? So, um, if we enumerate uh, naively all possible response strategies, um, the size of the answers, the size of this reduction will be something like big n to the big n, which is huge. Or even so, we cannot even afford a quasi-polynomial blow-up in big n. Remember, big n is two to the uh, square root n, roughly, and we want to solve SAT in, su in sub-exponential time. So. We cannot even afford to blow up a uh, uh, big N, even quasi-polynomially. Is, is that clear? So um, we have to be very, since we're already working on a scale of 2 to the square root N, and we want to solve SAT, we want to refute ETH, so we want to solve SAT efficiently, we, we have to be very careful with the blow-up sizes uh, in this reduction. So this reduction is just too big. Right, so the first step of, of our uh, reduction is to actually use a more efficient encoding of uh, the player's uh, uh, response strategies uh, in the payoffs of, of the game. So to this end, suppose we just suppose we just instead of enumerating all possible response strategies, let's actually this is a very bad picture because the sets are supposed to be symmetric here. So think of it as a the squared matrix, but suppose that uh, instead of enumerating over all possible full strategies, we let the players just pick a single challenge in a single answer for this challenge. Okay, so the pure strategies in the game is just 
all the uh, challenge comma answer pairs of the game. Is that clear? So instead of you know specifying a full strategy, Alice now specifies uh, a pair which is a challenge and uh, a specific, a particular answer A for this particular challenge and vice versa uh, for Bob. And the natural thing again is to give both players in a, the same reward of just uh, the value of uh, of this uh, uh, challenge uh, answer pair um, in the free game, right? So they get they get a payoff of one if and only if uh, uh, the referee accepts uh, uh, the answers. Uh, according uh, of these uh, particular challenges, S and T. And I put here a small star, so we actually, uh, this is almost true, we actually uh, will not want to give any reward, so the reward will be, the payoff will be zero to both players uh, if the challenge tuples S and T are not intersecting. So uh, we only give players this reward up here if the tuples, the square root n tuples, I remind you, S and T, have at least one legitimate edge, i and j, which appears in the original game. So if, if this will not be a very important uh, point right now, but uh, I just want to make uh, this subtlety clear because we will uh, use this uh, if we dive into more detail later. But um, essentially, so th this, is, this is the reduction. So one thing we did gain here. So obviously, the size here, we're, on, we're definitely OK on size-wise, right? Because the size of this reduction is, is very reasonable. It's actually uh, the size of this game is just uh, the cardinality of s times a times t times b, which is uh, still 2 to the square root n, roughly. Everyone agrees to, to, to that. Um, how about uh, correctness of this, this reduction? So, Clearly, uh, completeness goes through, right? If if the value of the free game is one, then Alice and Bob can always choose uh, their tuples S and T respectively, just by drawing a random challenge, right? This simulates the the independent uh, challenge choice in the free game age, and then they always are guaranteed to have. Um, some responses A and B respectively, which are induced by the optimal strategy for this game, which is guaranteed to have to succeed always, right? So bottom line is that if Alice and Bob just redraw their, pick their pairs according to a random challenge and the best answer uh, for this challenge, uh, they can get at least the payoff, uh, which is equal at least to the, the winning probability uh, in age. What about the soundness, though? So suppose now that uh, age sub phi has uh, the winning probability in age is only, let's say, 0 0.2, right? What happens now? So uh, so now what Alice and Bob can do, they remember the reduction is only specifies a particular pair. So Alice and Bob can now say, you know, the hell with the uniform distribution. Let's just focus on our favorite pair, S naught and T naught. We know we can answer this particular pair, and we'll just get a val we'll still get a value of one because we're able to satisfy this particular pair. Right. So the philosophical problem with this with this reduction is that uh, in this reduction we give Alice and Bob the control not only over answers but also uh, the control over choosing their challenges. All right. In, in, remember, in the, in the first reduction, we only gave them choice over the answering strategy. In this reduction, we're giving them the flexibility to choose their 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 challenges, the questions, as well as the answers. And this leads to the problem that they can just concentrate their mass on their favorite challenges and do away with uh, arbitrarily high uh, success probability. All right. So you know, what do we do now? So you know, if we could just force the marginals, if we could just add a spreading constraint, if we could just force Alice and Bob to spread uh, the distribution over challenges, or namely, and more formally, if we could force the marginal distribution of Alice's mixed uh, uh, strategy 
to be uniform on the challenge set and vice versa uh, for Bob, then a claim that uh, would be essentially done. Okay, so this is an important point, so uh, it might be a good point for questions if ever anyone has them. Okay, so uh, so this will be indeed uh, uh, the main goal of the, the remaining part of, of the talk. And of course, the main challenge is, you know, how to embed such spreading, uh, such a unif you know, such uniformity constraints into the payoff matrices. How do we technically uh, force the players to play uniformly on the challenges? So the basic approach that we take, the, the very high-level approach, is similar to that of Hazan and Krathgamer. Uh, what we'll do is we'll add in some auxiliary parts, uh, zero-sum games, into our uh, actual construction that will allow Bob to punish Alice if her distribution on challenges, uh, you know, highly uh, deviates from the uniform distribution. So figuratively, uh, Alice and Bob will now have the following. Let me just focus on Alice. So we will still have our original, so to speak, part of the game, which corresponds to H sub phi. This is the part we just described uh, in the last slide. But we will also have zero-sum games, A or A transpose. Uh, this is just a, a symmetric version. That, And we will say in a minute what A will be exactly. but Intuitively speaking, uh, the A part of this game will allow Bob to punish Alice if she ever defects from the uniform distribution. We will somehow re reward Bob and give him an incentive to defect uh, and gain a larger payoff. This will mean that uh, uh, playing far from uniform can never form uh, um, a Nash equilibrium or even an approximate equilibrium. Okay, an important part about uh, just the, the the ideology of this reduction is that since we only we are only adding uh, zero sum parts to our game, then these these parts are really only auxiliary in the sense that they do not contribute anything to the the welfare, and therefore any efficient just by the efficiency requirement any high welfare equilibrium will cannot avoid HV, right? In order to have a large welfare, you must have most of the mass of, an en of the equilibrium on the original part of the game, on H sub phi. Right? Any mass of the players that resides outside of HV will give uh, identically zero payoff um, if we sum the payoffs of the players. So morally speaking, this reduction, uh, well, at least it sounds like it has a chance, uh, but of course, how do we actually do this? What 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 is A exactly? So, so in Chazan and Krathgamer's uh, reduction, A was just chosen to be a, a completely random IID uh, Bernoulli uh, uh, matrix. So each entry was uh, something like a constant payoff, let's say 100 times a Bernoulli uh, one over 100 uh, random variable. So, um, morally speaking. In their reduction, each entry of A rewards one of the players with a very large payoff, much larger than one, let's say 100, with some roughly, uh, you know, 1 over 200 probability. Okay, so what I claim is that using such a matrix in their reduction, it, it suffice, but what, what using such a matrix uh, imposes is that it rules out uh, small support equilibrium. And why is that? So suppose that we use such a random matrix. If Alice ever tries to uh, to use a small support strategy, which is supported on significant significantly less than uh, log n entries, then just a direct calculation shows that she is guaranteed that Bob is guaranteed to find a corresponding set of columns on which the random matrix will evaluate to the big payoff to a hundred in each and every corresponding column. Okay, this this idea is actually much simpler to describe with a with a board, but uh, hopefully the idea goes through. So, since the matrix is random, um, if we're just if we're just attempting to find a con a small set of columns where all the payoffs of Bob will be high, we can do this 
But of course, if Alice chooses a large support, then with very high probability, no single row will give Bob an incentive to deviate. OK, the problem is that you know if we try to use such a construction, um, our reduction will miserably fail because we're actually seeking a much, much stronger uh, constraint. What we want is not only to rule out small support equilibria, but we actually want uh, a closeness to the to the uniform distribution, which is a it's a much harder, much stricter constraint, right? So, uh, maybe another way to phrase it is, uh, as far as I re can remember, using the same uh, idea of random matrices would require a huge blow, let's say ex an exponential size uh, a random matrix, and of course we cannot uh, afford this. So we somehow need uh, a new idea that. Uh, uh, will imitate, will enforce uh, closeness to the uniform distribution. And uh, this is roughly the way uh, we do it. So now I'm describing uh, the payoffs in A. So remember, what we want to, to, to uh, encode in A is uh, a large payoff to Bob uh, if Alice plays a uh, distribution which is far from the uniform distribution. So what we'll do is, in A, Bob will be able to specify uh, a set Z of size roughly square root N as well, some small constant rho times square root N. And now if Alice chooses her uh, challenge S according to some uh, far from uniform distribution mu, then we will give uh, Bob K dollars if Alice's uh, challenge tuple intersects this set Z. Okay, so again, let me uh, uh, repeat this. So we know that Alice, uh, let's assume Alice is choosing her challenge tuple S. Remember, S is now a square root N vector of original challenges from M. Now we will let uh, Bob choose a uh, similar, a comparably uh, large uh, set of, of roughly square root n elements. And now the intuition is that if, you know, if Alice chooses her, her tuple according to a very non-uniform distribution, suppose she focuses her, her choice on, on a singleton, which is the worst, the furthest from uniform you can imagine, then Bob faces a very easy task, right? He knows how to choose a set that will for, for sure intersect uh, Alice's uh, tuple, in which case Bob will gain k dollars, and k is, is large, think, about, think of it as 100, and we will uh, uh, give Alice a, a negative payoff of k. All right, any, any questions about this? Um, Okay, let me let me try and move on. We'll kind of repeat this uh, idea, uh, um, but um, as, as we go as we go on. But the important thing to note here is that since we so how many entries? What is the size of this uh, punishing matrix A? It's only uh, n to the square root n, right? Because we only allowed Bob to specify square root n size sets. So. How many sets do we have on square root n elements? Roughly uh, n to the square root n, right? So size-wise, again, we're we're okay. Size-wise, we didn't blow up the game um, significantly. Uh, a subtle point that I want to make is that well, we don't want to allow Alice to punish Bob if Alice actually pl plays fairly, right? We want this strategy to work only if Alice significantly defects from the uniform distribution, right? If Alice plays fairly, if Alice chooses her challenge S, her challenge tuple S according to the uniform distribution, we don't want Bob to be able to punish her, right? So uh, this requires choosing this uh, small constant row small enough so that uh, the opponent cannot, so, so that Bob cannot punish her. And indeed, uh, uh, let's do the following uh, thought experiment. So. We know that Bob gets a payoff of k whenever he intersects Alice's set, but if Alice plays fairly, she chooses a uniform set of size square root n, 
And what is the probability that a uniform size, uh, a uniform set of size square root n intersects a set of size, any set of size, uh, rho times square root n? This is just an arbitrarily small constant, right? What I'm trying to say here is that by choosing the constant here, the size of Bob's set, to be small enough, we can ensure that the optimal response strategy in age sub phi survives as a Nash equilibrium in the game. Okay? Alice and Bob will be able to punish each other only if one of them significantly deviates from the uniform distribution. All right? Um, okay, so what did we achieve uh, up to now? So one would expect that we would manage to impose uh, statistical closeness to, to the uniform distribution. But I claim that actually enforcing L1 closeness to, to the uniform distribution seems like uh, a too ambitious goal uh, using our construction. Remember, the support of S, the challenge tuple set, is a very big support, has supports of size something like this distribution is supported on 2 to the square root n entries, while, oops, sorry, while the constraint matrix A only allies, allows to specify constraints on very small subsets of the supports, only square root n sized subsets. Right, so this is not a proof, but at least intuitively, it doesn't sound like big, so to speak, big enough constraints to to actually inform, to enforce uh, statistical closeness. Okay, so indeed, what what our reduction, re uh, uh, what this construction uh, achieves is is a significantly weaker um, uniformity uh, condition. What we managed to show is that um, any mixed equilibrium in this uh, construction has to have not statistical closeness to uniform uh, distribution, but rather uh, uniform marginals on the, on the atomic challenges. So what, what do I mean by that? By that? So uh, what we managed to achieve is that for any original challenge, remember S is, an, is a square root n tuple of challenges, so any original challenge of the original game any challenge uh, i in n, the marginal frequency of this challenge has to be roughly what is expected to be, roughly 1 over n. Okay, so notice that this condition, this uniform marginal condition, need not imply statistical closeness, right? So, for example, suppose that Alice chooses her challenge tuple s, uh, according, she, it's just the u a uniform element of the following set. It's just she either chooses uh, the tuple 1 through uh, square root n or the tuple square root n through 2 square root n and so forth. Notice that the marginal frequency of each challenge, if she chooses a random element of these tuples, is exactly 1 over square root n. Right? Nevertheless, this distribution is obviously nowhere close to the uh, uniform distribution on square root n challenges. One way to see it is that, well, if, if, if element number one appears in our set, this completely excludes uh, the element, let's say, square root n plus one, right? Anyways, this, this, this should be, I mean, this is very easy to construct examples. So the bottom line here is that this uniform marginal constraints, the fact that each, each atomic challenge appears with a marginal frequency of roughly what it should be, 1 over n, it is not, uh, by no, mean, no means implies uh, statistical closeness. But luckily, and this is where we actually need to open the box and exploit the structure of, of the free game. This will be enough uh, for our purposes. And I will not uh, get, it's not a very deep reasoning why this uniform marginals is a sufficient condition. Uh, it, it a kind of a hand wavy uh, explanation for this is that, um, uh, so we want to show that uh, the, the probability of, sat so, 
just a second. So uh, the reason, roughly speaking, is that uh, the probability that the tuple S and T, uh, the challenge S and T, are being satisfied is, but just by a standard un union bound in the assumption that S and T at least have one intersecting uh, original edge, it has to be at most the probability that um, the edge IJ inside, which is induced by the tuples S and T, is being satisfied. Okay, let me let me say this again. The probability that the payoff that, for example, Bob uh, Alice gets when Alice and Bob play according to uh, uh, their strategies, uh, choosing S and T in responses A and B, is at most the sum of probabilities that the original edges I and J in induced by those two tuples are being satisfied. Okay, this is just. Uh, we should try to wrap up, um, but we can continue later. But let me try to wrap up uh, to see if there, I think we only have one more slide, but still. Right. Uh, so sh sh should I go on for like two more minutes? Uh, okay, <laughs> let's uh, let's try. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, the uh, the bottom line so so uh, if this is uh, convincing enough then the the only thing that is left to be convinced is is uh, how can we how how does this construction actually satisfy the the the, um, the uniform marginals uh, constraint and this is again I will not do the proof but um, uh, the intuition is that well. Uh, if uh, Alice and Bob are playing according to some approximate Nash equilibrium, and Alice is, uh, has uh, any challenge, any atomic challenges, challenge I that appears with uh, much larger uh, marginal probability than 1 over n, then Bob can add this element to his uh, set of punishing elements. And then just if we do this inductively, he can collect a, uh, a large enough set in order to punish Bob. But if he can, pu uh, in order, sorry, to punish Alice, but if he can punish her, then this cannot be an equilibrium, right? Because he'll have an incentive uh, to defect. So maybe I'll, uh, uh, that's all I, uh, I will say. Uh, let me just uh, point out that we never said where we're actually using the freeness of this game. We paid a huge price for making the, the game free, uh, something like 2 to the square root n. And potentially, we could repeat the reduction with no, without the, 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 the freeness assumption. The point is, and this goes back to the, the, the first, one of the first slides of the talk, is that at least taking this line of approach, the, the marginal distribution produced on challenges by any Nash equilibrium is inherently a product distribution, because Nash equilibrium is an uncorrelated uh, solution concept. So no matter what we do, somehow free games and 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 Nash equilibrium seem to be inherently related. So this is the th this is the only place, in fact, if I remember correctly, that we use the freeness uh, of the game. So just as future directions, uh, I think, um, or at least wishfully hope that uh, uh, similar techniques can be used to replace. Uh, Average case case hardness uh, uh, assumptions with uh, worst case assumptions such as uh, ETH and other applications. So, one of the notable problems which where we have very weak hardness results is uh, the densest uh, subgraph problem, uh, stable the related stable communities problem, which seems maybe more feasible, uh, and some crypto uh, systems which are based on. Uh, the planted clique conjecture, so it will be very nice to replace them, these assumptions with uh, ETH. And maybe the hardest questions uh, of them all is whether uh, using similar ideas can be used to show any, you know, any uh, uh, super polynomial uh, hardness results for, uh, uncon for the unconstrained version of the problem, so for, uh, for PPAD. Uh, and again, um, I think a super polynomial result under any reasonable worst case assumption, uh, even if it's not ETH, I think this will be interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any. <laughs>
Any questions? Any more questions? Um, so, so maybe only I'll just ask. So, so it seems at the end you're happy if you just get uh, support on square root and disjoint blocks, right, from both Alice and Bob, right? This this makes you happy if you get such a distribution. Uh, no, not exactly because. Remember, we only allowed for non-negative, non-zero payoffs if the tuples intersect each other. So these tuples do not actually intersect each other. I see. So that, that will just lead to zero or something, zero value. Right. So what you should be worried about is this equation right here, this upper bound. So I need to convince you that Alice's payoff when uh, she plays according to um, you and Bob plays according to new. The probability of satisfying this square, these square root n tuples is at most the sum of probabilities of satisfying the uh, induced edges by these two tuples. Now, implicitly notice that we're using the fact that these, this intersection is not empty. Otherwise, this inequality wouldn't have hold. Does that does that make so sense? How, how do you, uh, so how do you enforce it? Because I thought I thought all you can enforce is that the atoms have at most five over n. So in, in particular, this distribution is uniform over the blocks seems to be valid. Something you cannot uh, preclude, right? Does this make sense? It does. But are you referring to uh, to this right, distribution the of the blocks? Right. Okay, it's yeah. actually it's actually your example to be fair. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so right, so so the only place where th so what I claim is that this particular distribution over blocks would actually yield uh, a zero payoff. So we have nothing to prove because the definitions of payoffs in the game were that two disjoint blocks uh, um, give uh, zero payoffs. Right? Is that? Oh, sorry. So if both Alice, and, what I meant to say is that if both Alice and Bob choose a tuple according to this block distribution, then with very small probability they will intersect, in which case they will anyhow get a payoff of zero and therefore uh, uh, there is not much to prove in this case. So the only valid, so the only constraint, so maybe what you're saying is that uh, maybe this can almost be satisfied by choosing a similar distribution with uh, with many intersections or um, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying, right? I, I think that's what that's you're okay. saying. Um, if if I take Alice to be, yeah, good. I, I'm just saying that if we continued this bottom line equation, does everyone see this, by the way? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, so if we continue this equation, then I just want to, to, to connect this last term into the value of the original game. Remember, our soundness direction starts from... Uh, from a free game with value, let's say, 0 0.1. I want to try and convince you that so long as the, un the marginals are uniform of the challenges, then the, val the, the payoff of each player is not much larger than 0 0.1. So if you just continue, if you just continue the last equation here in the, in the bottom uh, of the page, then if you believe the first transition, the second transition is kind of immediate because the probability that uh, a challenge i belongs to s and a challenge j belongs to t is just the product of these distributions. This is just by definition of the, uh, right? Uh, right? These choices are independent of each other. And then the uniform probability, uh, the uniform marginals constraint says that the probability that i belongs to s is something like 1 over n. And then this whole sum shrinks to something like the sum over over uh, over uh, edges, not over tuples, over original edges, of the probability that uh, these edges are satisfied, and this probability is just—I don't care what A and B are; they're just strategies for the original game. And we know that no strategy for the original game can succeed with probability more than uh, zero point. Right. Good. Yeah, I think it's clear now. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks. Okay. Any, any other questions? Yeah, so I have I have one more question. So I mean the the way you showed it, this kind of 
obviously something about the Nash equilibrium. I mean, basically one thing about the Nash equilibrium, which may, seems to make it possible to have this quasi-polynomial time algorithm is that it's in some sense a free gain concept, right? The two distributions are independent. Right. Now there is also the concept, if I remember correctly, you will know better. There is also this concept of, uh, of a correlated Nash where you kind of have a, a, um, some help or outside so, help to 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 get info, right? Is is this correct? Is right. Uh, so so a referee can kind of uh, can and, can can yeah can break the. It's kind of form of public randomness. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and so how is the hardness there? Is there is is it kind of very similar to a two proofer game or is this? Uh, no. So actually, finding a correlated natural equilibrium is a very. It's a problem in P. So that's actually very easy because uh, essentially just the convexity of this. The, the, the point is that the set of uh, of uncorrelated Nash equilibria is just you know a, a non-convex uh, set, and the set of correlated Nash equilibria is a convex set. So you can just do linear programming and find the best correlated uh, Nash equilibrium in polynomial time. So. so so that seems very strange in some sense, right? That kind of the the in some sense the free concept coincides in some sense, but the coral. Uh, for, for, so I'm trying to so maybe. Well, kind of in some sense the what what you're showing is in some sense right the 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 Nash. I mean, you have this reduction from a free two proofer game to a to an to a, a Nash equilibrium, right? So there, the two concepts seem in some sense similar, right? But for the non-free case, they seem very different. Oh, I see what you see. You you mean? Oh, I see. So for so a, a general, you mean that a general two prover game? Uh, yeah, I, the complexity seems nowhere near. Uh, yeah. I, um. Yeah, that's uh, haven't thought about it, but that's uh, that's true. I think there is one uh, uh, result by Aram Harrow. I think I'm not sure I'm citing it correctly, but I think one of his results is that if you take a, a correlated Nash equilibrium and you repeat it in some fashion, I'm not sure exactly how, then somehow the correlation dissipates between the strategies and the limit of this process produces. Uh, it's an uncorrelated Nash equilibrium. So maybe this is kind of a smooth interpolation between these two concepts, and maybe this is worth uh, looking uh, into. But uh, yeah, uh, um, but but actually, what you're saying is a good way to to say that why there is no hope of of uh, of moving from a free game into uh, into just a uh, why there is no hope of doing of repeating the same uh, reduction for you know for general games yeah okay so I so suggest we go offline and thank everyone for watching and we'll see you again in the spring um, so also thanks Omri for the nice talk uh, you can stay here you don't have to run away we can still chat okay, okay. bye bye thank you everyone.